Next, I want to introduce Stephen Botkin. And Stephen, you've been doing this work for many years as well and have years of experience and expertise. And I'm really interested in what you've got to say, Stephen. And it's an honor to be uh, sharing this with you at this particular point in our lives, which is really, um, I think, significant both for us personally and I think for our movement is what, how, do we, um, how do we relate to those of us who are uh, aging out of leadership roles and uh, passing the baton and still wanting to be a resource and stay connected. So just anticipating that as a, um, you know, a question that I, I'm holding and I think we are holding. Um, so this is, this is a quick run through of uh, 35 years of, uh, of my life and I'll try to do this expeditiously and, and so there's time for discussion. It was interesting to me to note that my introduction to the men's movement was also at a men in masculinity uh, conference a few years after the one that Craig attended um, in, was it Iowa, Craig? Wherever that was. One Iowa for which? Number three? Yeah, well, the first one you attended. Number three in Des Moines, Iowa. Right. So, so a few years later, I went to uh, Boston and attended the number seven at Tufts University. And I was struck by a couple of things. One was that there was actually a movement of, of men nationally that was doing what was in my heart. Um, you know, it spoke to something very deep. And the other thing I noticed was that there was some incredible conflict that was being played out literally on the stage and in the hallways between men who felt like um, this, was, this was about being allies to women in preventing men's violence against women and others who felt that this was about helping men to unpack the, the oppressive or at least uh, restrictive and damaging nature of masculinity and that there was a real tension and I walked away very confused. I couldn't understand why these things that seem so naturally connected and part of a, of a, of a, a whole were being posed as oppositional to each other. And so it was that inspiration, both the sense of a movement and the possibility and my heart speaking and, and this wanting to uh, solve that dilemma and, and, not, and do it differently than what I was seeing and was the, the impetus for creating the Men's Resource Connection. And um, the, the, this was just a few, group of, a few men informally meeting together and going, there's something about connection that is central to the transformation that we believe needs to happen. And that group of men then sponsored a, um, a regional men's conference the next year. And like Craig said, it was a few months of time. We pulled it together. We had 250 people show up from DC to Maine and we were blown away by the response to what we had floated. And it really confirmed that there was something here that had tremendous potential. Um, and this was just, just to give you a little glimpse here of uh, the who we were in that particular moment in time. Um, and, and you can see that it, it was definitely a, a particular demographic and that was me at age 20, 29, I guess. At the same time, I, was at, I had um, started uh, graduate school in, at UMass Amherst in, the, in a program that became the Social Justice Education Program. So we were focusing on this question of how do we teach people about issues of social identity and social justice? And at my work in that program evolved to a clearer and clearer focus about gender and men. And so my doctoral dissertation was on developing gender consciousness among college men. And that really gave me a, another kind of academic platform and, and conceptual framework for thinking about the, what are the stages in the development of consciousness, of, of, of gender consciousness, specifically with men? And do we, do we go through stages in that? And what would it be like to create um, a system that would support the, that process of the evolution of consciousness. And so in those first years, and this was even before there was a, a, a formal organization, there was no incorporated entity, we, we simply called ourselves the Men's Resource Connection. We did a number of things. Some of them were on campus in partnership with the Every Woman Center, like Counseling Male Partners of Sexual Assault Survivors or Take Back the Night March support. And some of them were things that we did ourselves. Craig mentioned monthly men's brunches. We had those 
I, I started leading these weekend retreats in the woods with men called gentle warrior retreats. And they were intensive, you know, the stereotype about drug, getting naked and drumming. Well, that's what we were doing. And, and yet it was with a, a, a framework that I would say was markedly feminist. Um, and we did peace walks and other uh, evidences of men being present in the community. And in 1988, this was, so this was six years after that first gathering of men saying, we want to create a men's resource connection. The men's resource center was incorporated. And it, so we took a leap from being a very grassroots informal thing to saying there's something here that deserves the status of corporation, even though we didn't, we were not, didn't affi affiliate with the concept of corporation. We, we took that leap and we started to create an entity that could do more consistent programming. And so we started creating drop-in men's support groups um, that were, that expanded to probably five or six a week that ranged from open men's groups to men who were survivors of childhood abuse, to men who were partners of women who were, had been assaulted, to men who identified as gay, uh, bisexual, or questioning. We also started the uh, batter intervention program that was modeled after a program that was being done in San Francisco. Um, and we actually, we, we purchased this house in, in downtown Amherst and it was the base for all of our programming. We worked closely with the Every Woman Center on campaigns that were uh, public awareness and, and education. And we participated in events. This happened to be the Pride March uh, event, but they, we participated in lots of events and, and signature campaigns and celebrations um, you know, that made us visible in the community. We had started publishing, right, back in 1982, we started publishing a, a newsletter that was typewritten on an electric typewriter and Xeroxed and put in postal mail. And that evolved over time with a large part with the leadership of Rob to a, a quarterly magazine that continues to this day. Um, we, we then started to help uh, other we were contacted and made co in connection with other people around the country who are interested in this model of a men's resource center. And lo and behold, Emiliano showed up on our screen and um, had the honor to support him in the creation of the men's resource center of South Texas. And with some of his work, his early, early work with TASA. Um, and um, so we were starting to see like, who, this is very interesting. There's multiple men's centers around and what would it mean to build a, a sense of connection and support? So we gathered uh, three from three men's resource centers uh, for a, a, a number of days in Northern New Mexico and asked that question, what would it mean to create a coalition of, of men's centers? And we were exploring that a little bit. We were also getting contacted by internationally that people were curious about what, you know, what were you doing at its community level um, and, and what would that mean in our own context? And in fact, we ended up going, traveling to Japan and, and doing a series of speaking engagements there. Um, and so what became more and more obvious was that this was not an isolated, whoops, this was not an isolated event um, that, that in fact all around the world there were men who were eager to be um, part of this movement and work in partnership with women. Um, and so the Men's Resources International emerged out of that with the idea that we, were, we wanted to focus specifically on how to share the lessons and skills um, that we had been developing in our community and really with a question, were they relevant in other contexts? And we were starting to get signals that yes, in fact, this, there would be some value um, to that these would be adaptable and translatable. And so we'd started to develop our uh, frameworks and practices uh, of how to share this in ways that would be meaningful in other parts of the world. But at the same time, we said, we can't do this. We can't go into other parts of the world without actually doing the work in our own home community. And we, we opened an office in, in the city of Springfield, Massachusetts, which is down the road from Amherst, but it's a very different uh, demographic in many different ways. And part of the commitment of Men's Resources International was not to create another uh, basically white oriented and white based organization. And so we started doing trainings in Springfield, Massachusetts. And out of those trainings emerged community based initiatives. And this is very typical of what we see happening in the consulting work is that with some, with some training and support, people in their own community are eager and ready to start organizing. This is in Springfield, a initiative that was called, is still operating, is called Men of Color Health Awareness. It was based at the YMCA. Um, it is now becoming more and more independent. 
Um, this was MOCA on the steps of City Hall with the mayor, um, really making visible the, that men of color, uh, ch challenging the, some of the stereotypes about men of color and making commitments to show up in the community in a particular way. Our first international training was in Zambia. Um, and uh, we had just set up our website, Men's Resources International, got contacted by a guy in Zambia who was working for the YWCA there as a counselor. And he was seeing all these women coming in. And he recognized that the reason that these women were coming in, vast majority of them was because of the men in their lives. And he said, what can I do about it? He found our website and said, would you come and do a training for us? And this was the first training. We had a big question. Would our methodology, would our approach be meaningful in an African context? And this was the staff of the YWCA and men that they had recruited to start um, a Zambia men's network. Uh, and lo and behold, it was fabulous. It was very exciting, a really strong, positive response. And then shortly after that, we were contacted by a woman in Nigeria who runs a, a women's organization there. And she said, I want to start a men's center in our community, can you come and help train us? And um, out of that training, the Eboni Men's Resource Center was formed. And so what we're seeing is, you know, this, this is really, this can really catch on. And then we had, uh, we had been contacted by this man, Fidel, from Rwanda, shortly before the Nigeria training. And he said, oh, I'm really interested in what you're doing. I want to start something in our area. And we said, well, come to the Nigeria, come to Nigeria, participate in this training. He participated in the training. At the end, he stands up and he says, I'm going to go back to Rwanda and start the Rwanda Men's Resource Center. And so that was very inspiring. We worked with him in Rwanda for a number of years, providing them different kinds of training and support. And at this point, the Rwanda Men's Resource Center is an amazing national organization, 50 full-time employees. Lots of funding at, from international funders. It's really a model um, in Africa for what is possible there, starting from the grassroots level. And about the same time, um, the International Rescue Committee had put out a call for uh, help starting a men's uh, involvement project in Liberia. They had women's action groups that were working on gender-based violence prevention. And they, the women were saying, you know, we really can't do this without the men involved. And so uh, the IRC said, let's, let's do some training and get uh, men involved. And we did a series of trainings and then some training with trainers to teach um, men to help create men's action groups in their own communities. Um, one of the core skills, um, of course, is learning, as Craig talked about, learning how to listen to women. Um, and that, that is always transformational. And these are the, this is an example of what happens when, the men, when there's real partnership developed and the men's action groups are um, not trained in isolation. It wasn't, when, when we did our trainings, it wasn't taking men off and going separately. It was actually men and women together in the room learning about the issue and thinking together about how to deal with, you know, this, this dilemma of masculinity. And this was in a place in, in Liberia called Chocolate City. And they had, the, the men had said to the women, well, what, how can we help? And the women said, well, you can build us a women's center or you can help us build a women's center. And they did that. And this was the opening day of the women's center. And one of the women had, had made matching outfits for everybody. It was a great celebration. And out of these men's and women's action groups around the country, they created a national campaign. So this was they called it the MAPEVA campaign, Men as Partners in Ending Violence Against Women. And they organized all across the country marches and rallies. They had the, the chief cell phone provider in the country send out a text message to every single, every single subscriber about men as partners in ending violence against women. It created a bit of a stir because some men got that text and they thought it was personal. Um, the, the IRC then brought us into the Ivory Coast and we did some work there with staff and community leaders. Um, this was the Women's Peacemakers Program for 10 years had been running uh, global peacemaking trainings, peace builder peacemaking trainings for women around the, around the world. And similarly, the women started saying, we can't do this peacemaking work in our own communities without engaging men. So the Women's Peacemakers Program decided to, to uh, conduct a training of trainers for male peace builders. And they hired uh, us as one of the co-trainers and designers for that. Um, 17 men from 19 different countries came together for two weeks in, in Amsterdam, and then six months later for two weeks in the Philippines. 
Um, and many of these men are now uh, leading initiatives in their own communities. Um, as some of you may recognize some of them. So Stephen, this is Chuck. You asked me to let you know when 15 minutes have passed and 15 minutes has passed. Thank you, Chuck. I'll just keep whizzing through here. Um, so the, we kept getting requests for trainings in different contexts. This was a South Asia context. This was for care in Niger, Niger and Mali. Um, and there was other requests that came in for some remote work with uh, reviewing a manual for counselors of men who commit intimate partner violence. We did a cl class for the School of International Training on women and men as partners in peace building. Uh, we were back in Liberia through Concern worldwide, and we worked with Concern also remotely for developing a curriculum and coaching for a class for Syrian refugee men. Um, the, the UN hired us in Albania to develop a national action plan, um, which was a very exciting uh, piece of work. And CARE hired us again to go back to, to go into Myanmar and do some staff training and curriculum development and training of trainers. Um, the women and men as partners in peace building work has been very important emerging theme. And we did this, we've been working with a, another peace building organization in the Great Lakes region of Africa and have gone there a number of times working with, with women and men uh, organizations. And of course, the men engage work has been um, a, a theme since 2004, both at the global and national and, and regional. Uh, I'm, I'm also on the board of the local domestic violence uh, organization and the, you know, the interesting story here, the arc is that it, when we formed Men's Resource Connection, two of us went and knocked on the door and said, ta-da, we're here, we're, we're men allies, are, you know, aren't you excited? And they were like less than excited and told us to go and work with other men because they had their hands full. And um, we have all come a long way since then. And, um, you know, now there are m multiple men on that board and Safe Passages is thinking uh, in new ways about uh, engaging men. So the kind of the last stage in this chapter is uh, the Men's Resource Center for Change and Men's Resources International has just, have just merged together to form one organization called Merge for Equality. And I have passed the baton of executive directorship um, in this last year, and that is a major transition for, for me. And I'm very excited about what Merge is doing. We've now had three annual Healthy Men and Boys Summits um, that have brought together people from across Massachusetts and the region. Um, and that's an exciting development. We've also run trainings um, I'm just, I'm not going to look at these. These are, these are some of the, you know, the things that have emerged from our, um, our practice and our frameworks and our methodology. That's, that's material for, I would say, a, a larger conversation. Um, challenges. Well, you know, we're knowing, we're understanding gender in ways that we hadn't um, when, when Craig and I, I think, first started this work, at least for me. You know, the whole framework of transgender, what that means, or, or gender queer. Um, creating financial sustainability is still a major issue. It was, it was there from the beginning. And, you know, as, as I look at Merge coming out on as this new organization, um, that's a huge question. Transitioning organizational leadership, I, I, I'm, you know, curious to hear from Craig a little more about how that is going to get navigated at Jane Doe. I know that for me, when I left the Men's Resource Center, I don't think I did, I know I did not do that transition well, and I could, you know, that that, that was uh, something I wasn't sophisticated about and made assumptions, and I feel like now, this with this next stage, it's being done better, but it's still a tricky thing. Um, the pool of consultants and trainers that um, is available to do the work that is needed, I think is it, need, it needs to be expanded. And as Craig said, the idea of supporting the next generation of activists and leaders, that feels really dear to our hearts as we enter this next stage of our, uh, our journey. So, this is Shane from Toronto. Hey, Shane. Hey, Shane. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say I, I just feel very empowered and very encouraged by both presentations. And just listening to the trajectory of um, Stephen's journey from, you know, inception. And I think it, it motivates me as a 
what I would say as a as a younger activist, you know, up and coming to just realizing the the, the challenges that are ahead, but certainly the the process of navigating that and how to stay on track and how to be self encouraged and I just I, I feel very, very empowered by, by that presentation and I just wanted to know that. Thank you. There's a 